So this is kind of the introductory topic that we have to, to the shoulder. So we're going to talk a little bit about technical consideration of doing shoulder imaging. Uh, then we'll go in and we'll talk about impingement and uh, concepts about that, rotator cuff disease, instability labrum, and then a whole host of other findings around the shoulder later. Now, uh, typically the, the protocol that we do here for high field and this uh, We've got a bunch of musculoskeletal radiologists in the room. I think not a single one of them was happy with this protocol, but they're all willing to accept it. Everybody had their own protocols. So we do uh, an oblique coronal uh, fat suppressed, I mean, fat spinaco T2, not fat suppressed, oblique coronal PD fat set, an axial T1, an axial PD fat set, and then an oblique sagittal T2 sequence. And I'll kind of explain when we go through this the kind of the rationale behind coming up with this. A lot of people like fat suppressed uh, sagittal T2s and for some of our orthopedic surgeons we'll do both the T2 and a PD fat set. Uh, in general I think uh, it's not necessary to do both uh, unless you're just used to using that. Uh, we really like not fat suppressing the sagittals because I think it's important to evaluate, be able to evaluate the, the fat within the rotator cuff interval, which is an important sign for frozen shoulder, which is one of the more common diagnoses we make. And if you fat suppress it, then you're not as able to evaluate that particular diagnosis. So uh, different techniques, this is what a T1 weighted image looks like. As you all know, the fat within the bones, the black cortical margins, kind of the gray signal intensity within the soft tissues. Uh, T2, the muscle is a little bit darker than on the T1. Fat continue is, is continued bright if it's a fast spinaco type T2. And then the PD fat set, where the uh, the muscle is brighter, tendons stay low in signal intensity, and then the fat is suppressed within the bones. And this highlights a lot highlights a lot of the soft tissues. And as you know, the PD fat set is sensitive for edema syndromes both within the bone and within the soft tissues. Looked at a lot of different uh, axial techniques for for a high field. Uh, we we prefer the T1 so that we don't suppress the fat and have fat as a contrast agent, especially for soft tissue changes. And then the PD fat set, which allows us to see the labrum and and tendons and so forth uh, well. <clears throat> uh, now some people like a T2 fat suppressed sequence, and it makes the the fluid brighter, as you can see here. You can see the margins of the cortex, but you'll lose a lot of signal to noise when you do a T2 fat suppressed. Even though we went to a higher TR to try to get uh, more signal back, uh, you end up with a noisier images. And I think in general, what you get is a much more black and white type image, which has a lot of contrast, but you lose a lot of the grayscale information within the soft tissues when you go to the T2 fat set. And I just think the loss of signal to noise, the loss of soft tissue contrast uh, isn't, isn't worth seeing a little bit sharper margins, but at the, uh, car, at the uh, uh, interface between the fluid and the, uh, uh, and the cartilage. And we have a true T2 weighted sequences uh, in the, the other planes, which allow us to see that articular cartilage. So we typically, uh, here, do almost all uh, PD fat sub set type imaging and not the long TE imaging uh, at high field. Uh, now, here's a prior, prior uh, Major League Baseball player. He uh, had surgery uh, with a prior slap repair here. You can see that there's a lot of metal artifact on the uh, uh, axial T1 weighted images in this uh, arthrogram sequence. Notice how subtle that little fleck of, of uh, metal is on the CT scan and how much a uh, much more sensitive MR is to these small metal artifacts uh, than, than CT is. Okay, now at low field we use a little different technique and uh, quite honest with you, I'm not, I don't really like doing low field imaging for the shoulder. Uh, but we often have to do it, uh, partly because a lot of patients just demand uh, the more open scanner, uh, and they're a lot quieter than the, than the high-field scanners. Uh, 
we typically do three coronal sequences, a T1, a T2, and a STIR, axial T1. Uh, PD fat sat for most low field scanners is not a very good technique because you don't get enough separation between the, uh, the fat and the water. So that uh, we typically use axial gradient echo sequences. It's kind of a, in the early days, it kind of had contrast like a T2, but it's really not very good contrast. And quite honest with you, I don't get a lot of information from the gradient echoes. And then we do an oblique uh, sagittal fast spin echo T2. The fluid sensitive image really for edema is the stir sequence in the coronal plane here. But since there's a lot of limitation and and uh, spatial resolution with the stir, we only do the stir in one plane, which we think is the most important. With an arthrogram, uh, we put in the dilute uh, gadolinium contrast, uh, and then do, uh, we just fat set a, a T1 sequence in the coronal plane, then the rest of the sequences are similar. We have an axial T1 fat set. We also do most most places we do an axial PD fat set as well to get another look at uh, uh, edema within the bones. Now there's a lot of discussion over the years between the the value of 3T versus 1.5T. Uh, my uh, my experience uh, over the years is that there's a huge difference between uh, uh, field strength below 1.5 and 1.5 and 3T. Uh, even uh, the scanners that we have that who are which are at 1.2 Tesla, there seems to be, and I think there's we know a lot of the reason why, but there is a big difference in contrast uh, between about one Tesla and 1.5 Tesla, <laughs> which makes the 1.5 and 3 Tesla uh, much better at contrast for most things in the musculoskeletal system than a one Tesla scanner. Uh, there's one exception that we'll get into when we talk about wrist imaging. Uh, but but otherwise, uh, I, I really believe that 1.5 and 3 Tesla imaging is very advantageous, especially in shoulder imaging. Uh, it's not been clearly shown that going to 7T is a significant advantage, uh, but uh, we'll see. We, we still, uh, there's still data coming in on, on that. Uh, uh, the, then the other question is, to do arthrography or not. And, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of driving factors for arthrography. In the early days, radiologists were used to making diagnosis on x-ray arthrography with the shoulder, and a lot of the early radiologists uh, weren't comfortable looking at MR by itself, and they were used to putting arthrography in. Uh, I think uh, there's certainly get a lot more reimbursement for the radiology department if you do arthrography than if you don't do arthrography. Uh, <clears throat> Personally, uh, we actually published a couple of papers back in the late 1980s and early 1990s in some of the orthopedic literature uh, at that particular time where we didn't believe in very small studies that arthrography was, was that much more valuable. Uh, and uh, uh, this was a study recently in 2016, uh, which also didn't show that there was really an advantage uh, for looking for rotator cuff tears with arthrography. Most people, if they do arthrography to the shoulder, they use it more for evaluating labral tears, where it may be somewhat valuable. But in, with modern imaging, uh, I really think that there's very little added value to arthrography over standard imaging, even for looking at rotator cuff tears. But a lot of it also depends on the experience that people have and their confidence in reading studies. So. We do a lot of MR arthrography because some of our orthopedic surgeons uh, like it, uh, but in general, uh, I, I don't recommend it for shoulder imaging. So uh, here is a young athlete with uh, shoulder pain. Uh, let's see, Michael, what do you think of this? Uh, young athlete with shoulder pain, rule out rotator cuff tear. Um, so on the first left image, we see uh, T2. There's increased signal kind of throughout the striations of the um, supraspinatus muscle. On the T1 fat set, it's this is an arthrogram because there's bright signal in the joint. It looks like there's also maybe some bright signal kind of in the arthrogram. And it's also increased signal within the fat set. 
So it might be, this might just be contrast within the Super Spinatus. But there's not a ton in the T1 bat set. Uh, actually have a super spinatus injection and uh, uh, here's another patient uh, one thing to remember with arthrography this is a, a CT is that uh, there are a number of different approaches to arthrography most people here at RADNET will do the anterior approach but when you do the anterior approach, if you remember, well, we haven't gone through it yet, but when we go through the anatomy, the supraspinatus, the, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa is continuous anteriorly into the subcorcoid bursa. So if you get uh, fluid in the subacromial uh, subdeltoid bursa from rotator cuff tear, uh, you can often see it in the subcorcoid bursa. And sometimes you may see very little in the subacromial sub subdeltoid bursa, and it'll all come collect dependently in the subcorcoid bursa. So we'll talk about that being an important sign. The thing to realize here is that when you could use the anterior approach, you actually often penetrate through the anterior part of the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and people often will leak contrast, as you've all seen, and the uh, subscapularis and the anterior soft tissues, and that can leak into the subacromial subdeltoid uh, bursa. So a little bit as opposed to, to X-ray arthrograms, where if you saw contrast in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, it was a reliable indication that, uh, that there was a tear of the rotator cuff. Uh, with MR arthrography, depending upon the technique, you may get a little bit of contrast in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, even though the rotator cuff is intact. So, so just be, be careful of that. And here you can see there's the injection site through here, and here's the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and they got leakage of the uh, contrast directly into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, even though the rotator cuff is intact. So uh, just, just be aware of that. Now, there was a paper uh, back in the old days, probably 1989, and in and, and radiology, one month a paper came out saying that MR was worthless for looking at uh, labral tears. Uh, the next issue of uh, the Journal of Radiology said that MR was 97% accurate in evaluating labral tears. Both used the same scanner, uh, but there, there was a difference in the technique. The, uh, the, the group that said that MR was worthless at looking at uh, uh, labral tears scanned their shoulders at a 24 field of view. And the, uh, the group that said that it was highly accurate scanned their shoulders at a 12 centimeter field of view. And this is the same patient scanned at those two, with those two different techniques. And you can see that resolution is very important. This is the same shoulder. Notice uh, you really need resolution to be able to see the details of the articular cartilages here. Uh, and here, now, the normal recess, which we'll talk about as a nice curvilinear appearance like this, this is normal. Uh, straight is usually indicative of a tear. So you could see where someone might call this a question of a tear. We wouldn't. Uh, now, but but this was a long time ago. Uh, uh, but but as you can see, that if you don't have adequate resolution, you really can't see the morphology, which may be important in making diagnosis. So the the difference between the two papers wasn't that MR was not a good technique for providing labral tears. It's just that if you use MR, you have to use the proper acquisition protocols uh, to make the accurate diagnosis. So looking at a little bit of anatomy, let's start in the sagittal plane. Here's the, the scapular blade here, the acromion process coming off posteriorly. Here's the cococlavicular ligaments, which we'll talk a lot about later. Uh, if we go more laterally here, we can see uh, uh, the uh, humeral head here, the cocoid process here, cocohumeral ligament up above. We can see the acromion process, the acromion clavicular joint, and the, and the uh, distal clavicle here. And then obviously the, the muscles, this is the subscapularis tendon anteriorly, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor back there. And then teres major down here with the latissimus dorsi. Uh, going a little farther out, uh, we can see the acromion process. We can look at its shape that we'll talk about, the AC joint, and then again the, 
rotator cuff muscles and tendons, and then the lung head of the biceps tendon, which you can see in the joint space here. Uh, if you have a large effusion or if you do contrast, then you can often see the biceps tendon quite nicely in the sagittal plane because you have fluid around it. Uh, I still uh, look for it even without fluid in the joint space, and you can usually follow it from its attachment to uh, the superior part of the glenoid and then follow it out into the joint space and down into the intertuberous groove. This is a very common location for a tendinopathy of the biceps tendon that we'll talk about. Going in the axial plane, uh, here's the, the T1 with an arthrogram and the PD fat sat. Uh, we can see inferiorly here the articular cartilage on the glenoid, the normal glenoid and, and uh, humeral head. Going up, we can see the articular cartilages, the anterior and posterior labrum. And then here we can see this is the middle glenohumeral ligament. We're going to talk a lot about that later here. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about the, the characteristic anatomy of the middle glenohumeral ligament where we can differentiate it from other structures. There are basically three structures anteriorly here that we have to differentiate. There's the middle glenohumeral ligament. There's the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, which may attach very superiorly, which may be a structure here in the middle, and then the anterior labrum. And if you get to tear the anterior labrum, it could masquerade as either of the other two. And sometimes the other two may make you think there's a labral tear. So we'll talk about ways to differentiate uh, true labral tears uh, from these other anatomic variants. And if you go superiorly here, this is the middle glenohumeral ligament, that's the anterior labrum. And occasionally, if you have a high superior insertion of the anterior band of the anterior glenohumeral ligament, you'll see a third structure here, and they all come together uh, uh, here uh, in the anterior superior aspect of the labrum. Uh, right near the next cut up, we would see uh, 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 the anterior. Uh, ligament that we'll talk about later. And then in the coronal plane, here's the middle glenohumeral ligament coming down, and it attaches to the deep surface of the subscapularis. Uh, and then here's that common location where the superior glenohumeral ligament, uh, this, the anterior superior labrum, and the middle glenohumeral ligament come together, and occasionally the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament. And just posterior to this is the insertion of the biceps tendon, or what we call the biceps anchor, right in through here. Uh, and there's some variants. You can occasionally get a defect in the central part of the of the glenoid, which can be a congenital uh, abnormality. This is uh, has a number of different names. A lot of people just call it a central defect. If it's nice and smooth like this, you don't see any bony reactive changes uh, and no degenerative disease within the joint space, then this can be a, a normal variant, just like you can see it in the acetabulum that we'll talk about when we get to the hips. Okay, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we have a 55-year-old female, and we're ruling out a rotator cuff tear. We have multiple axial sequences. Um, we're kind of scrolling down here from superior to inferior. So there's one thing I want you to look at, and that's what is this? Uh, is that the... Where are we? Is this a short head? No. Okay. So here's the obviously the humeral head, the supraspinatus tendon. Supraspinatus. It's a coronoid, yeah. Coracoid process. Coracoid process here. So this this. Okay. Now, see, in this case, there's fluid around it. Is this the short head? No. No. Yeah. Okay. So this uh, is something that looks like it's coming from the muscle anteriorly, but it's going over the coracoid process. And across the joint space here. Oh, uh, this is a variant. Okay. So, pec, pec minor. Okay. So that's a variant of pec minor. So there are, there are a lot of, there, there are a fair number of anatomic variants around the shoulder uh, that we'll talk about. Uh, this is one that's uh, usually not, not, not recognized, which is no big deal since it's a really a normal variant. But occasionally, you'll have this prominent structure going across the top of the joint space, and uh, uh, it'll be an issue as to what it is. And you just have to remember in the back of your mind that there is an anomalous insertion that you can occasionally get of the pec minor, and you just have to follow it back to the, the pec minor. And this is the pec minor muscle right here. 
In this case, there's a lot of fluid around it, and this one was probably symptomatic. It goes over the coracoid process. Okay. Okay, and then here it just shows that the pec minor, it should go up to the coracoid process, but occasionally you'll have a slip that will go beyond the coracoid process into the superior part of the joint space. And there's, an, there's another example of this same anatomic variant going through across the superior part of the joint space. And so normally here, this is in the area of the rotator cuff interval, you normally don't have an oblique structure here, but occasionally if you look for this, you'll see it rarely, and that's an anomalous insertion. And there it is coming across the top of the, of the, uh, of the joint space. And see how it goes across the top of the coracoid process. And then uh, often when you see it is in the coronal plane. And you can see it coming across here. And it goes all the way out. The other thing that you can, you can see it going superior to the short head of the biceps here. Now the other thing that can be a thickening of the supraspinatus in this location is called the cable. We won't talk a lot about that because we typically don't see it very well on MR, but you do see it at arthroscopy. It's a, but we'll, I think we'll talk to it. We'll, we'll talk about it when we get to the rotator cuff, but you'll hear surgeons often talk about the, the cable, the rotator cuff cable and, and its uh, significance. And we'll come back to that uh, when we talk about the rotator cuff tears, but it, it can also, uh, be depicted on MR as a thickening here. It just doesn't extend anteriorly uh, uh, over the coracoid process. It, it, it involves only the, the uh, supraspinatus tendon and maybe a portion of the infraspinatus. Okay, so that's an anomalous insertion of the pectoralis minor. So it's about 1.5%. And this is just other examples. And we'll, go, we'll skip by this. And some people say, well, anyway, let's go ahead. Okay, here's a 16 year old male pain. Jennifer, what do you think of this? I'm not sure I can see the infraspinatus insertion here and it looks intact. Um, this is this have, this variant is anterior. Okay. Let's go all the way down. Hmm. This is a hard one because mm -hmm. it's the absence of something. Mm, okay. It's always harder when you have something happen. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of the biceps? I'm so far I'm not seeing a normal biceps tendon in the bicipital groove. Yeah, you don't see a normal intertubular screw here. Yes. And down here we see no biceps tendon. Yes. Here, uh, the biceps should attach right up here. Mm -hmm. And if you come out here, there's, there's no bicep tendon coming across the, the humeral vein. Mm -hmm. So, this is a situation of congenital absence of the biceps tendon. And I think you should only call this in the setting where you do not have a developed intertuberous groove. Because it's believed in development that you need a biceps tendon to develop the, the intertuberous groove of the humeral head. And if you have a true congenital absence, you do not have a bicipital groove. If you have a bicipital groove and no tendon, then it's a tendon tear. And here's just another example, 23-year-old male pain after injury, and we don't really see uh, a well-developed intertuberous groove. And this was a congenital absence. Okay, so now let's talk about the anatomy of the bicep sling. Uh, 
So uh, if we look at the front of the shoulder, we have the supraspinatus tendon up here, the subscapularis tendon down here, the transverse tendon, uh, the transverse ligament uh, is really a continuation of the superficial fibers of the subscap that go that where it attaches to the lesser tuberosity, then their continuation of fibers across the intertuberous groove to the greater tuberosity where they insert, and this holds the biceps tendon into the bicipital groove. And this is the superior capsule up here. Now, furthermore, if we look at the biceps anchor, so the biceps comes up and it anchors here mm -hmm. uh, superior to the superior labrum on the superior tubercle of the glenoid. Uh, the uh, uh, superior glenohumeral ligament attaches just anterior to inferior to that. It comes under the biceps tendon and it acts like a sling to keep the biceps tendon from subluxing anteriorly into the subscapularis tendon. And you've all seen examples so far uh, where the, the biceps tendon has subluxed anteriorly. And this uh, superior glenohumeral ligament helps stabilize it so that doesn't happen. That the injury. Uh, where the biceps becomes unstable, subluxes anteriorly into the subscapularis tendon, used to be called the hidden lesion because it was a lesion you couldn't really see at arthroscopy. You couldn't see it by x-ray techniques. And the, the diagnosis had to either be made by uh, directly uh, uh, direct visualization at surgery going into, uh, going into this area, which was not arthroscopically easy, uh, uh, detectable because it's really extracapsular. Uh, uh, so it was a typical, it was a difficult diagnosis to make. It had to be made clinically with anterior pain. Uh, MR makes it much easier now. And we'll go through a whole classification system for this uh, in a little bit. Uh, and uh, this is a, a common problem. Uh, back, uh, you know, the, the, there was a, a, a quarterback for the, for the, Denver Broncos a number of years ago, who was uh, quite well known, who in his last three years had some really bad shoulder pain and kept complaining about it. But all the studies he had uh, before he had an MR scan were all normal. Uh, and then uh, uh, he was practicing for his last Super Bowl, and all of a sudden he felt a pop in his shoulder, and the pain that he'd had for the last three years went away. And then on MR examination, what happened is uh, that he tore his biceps tendon up here. And once he tore the tendon and it uh, dislocated, all of his pain went, went away and he went on to win the Super Bowl. And uh, uh, he came into his surgeon and was really angry. He said, well, why did you leave this in all this time? You mean three years ago you could have cut the tendon and I wouldn't have had to have all that pain? So it can be a very painful lesion in this area when you get instability of the, of the biceps in this location. And we'll talk about that. So this is kind of, kind of how the superior glenohumeral ligament wraps under the biceps and it holds it into position to keep it from subluxing. Uh, now, I, just, I want to put this a little bit about rotator cuff now, which is a little bit out of order, but I want you to think about the seven things uh, that some orthopedic surgeons think should be in every MR report where you're concerned about rotator cuff tears. And this is Dick Hawkins, uh, who is at the uh, Stedman Hawkins Clinic at that particular time in Vail, Colorado. He's a shoulder, he was a shoulder surgeon. Uh, uh, and uh, he since moved uh, to South Carolina, I believe. I think he's retired now. Uh, but he said of the things that he, that he wants, he wants to know the size of the tear, the quality of the surrounding tissues, the location of the tear, how much fatty infiltration you have in the muscles, whether or not you've got superior migration of the humeral head. He wants to know about the acromial morphology, and then finally here the status of the biceps tendon, because the biceps tendon is commonly a source of pain in people with rotator cuff tears, and it doesn't make any sense to go in and fix the supraspinatus tendon tear if most of the pain is coming from the biceps and you leave that untreated. So it's important to comment on that. So, so let's go through it. So how do we talk about the size and location of tears? Again, this is a technical section right now. So in a T1-weighted image, we really don't see details of the tendon very well, as you all know. So this is a patient who actually has a big tear. It's hard to see with 
the T1, this doesn't look like normal black uh, tendon tissue, but you really don't have a good idea of just how much disease is in the tendon. With the PD fat cell, we can see that there's a full thickness tear here. There's retraction of the muscular tendinous junction and a lot of increased signal intensity within the tendon. So there's severe tendinosis involving the entire tendon and this large tear. But on the PD fat set, it's hard to actually determine the exact size of the tear. If we go to the T2 weighted images, notice that the margins of the tear are often much better seen on the T2 weighted sequence because you don't have all the tendinos increased signal intensity from the tendinosis, which obscures the margins uh, that, like you have on the uh, PD fat sat sequences. So I generally measure the size of the tear on the T2 weighted sequences. And that's one of the reasons why on the shoulders, we don't do a T1 or a PD and a PD fat sat. We do a T2 and a PD fat sat because what we want a T2 sequence, which allows us to make more accurate measurements of the size of the tendon tears. So uh, we believe that the non-fat suppressed T2 best defines the margins of the tears when compared to arthroscopy. Now, it's- uh, John, are, are you measuring um, the retraction or are you measuring the size? The size, the difference between here and here. Uh, isn't that, the, isn't that re retraction? Yeah, well, this would be the retraction. This would be the size in the coronal, pl in the uh, medial lateral plane, coronal plane. And then we also look at it in the sagittal plane to get the anterior posterior diameter. Yeah, that's what I mean. Um, um, L-shaped tears and so on. Um, yeah. They're, they're hard to measure. Right, that's right. That's I would right. think. Yeah, so we do the best we can. And I usually take the largest linear measurements in the lateral and in the anterior posterior. Uh, okay. to determine the, the tear size. Now, we've actually tried to do studies to see whether this correlates well with, with, with arthroscopy. The problem is that when you go in arthroscopically, you really change a lot of the anatomy. So you, you go in, you put in fluid, you, you change the pressures in the joint space and so forth. So you really distort the anatomy. So it's hard to get a direct correlation. Uh, but uh, at this point, uh, uh, we really believe that the T2 non-fat suppress give us the most accurate measurements. Okay, and then here we can see, uh, here's another kind of tear with different contrasts between the different techniques. Here's, this is an arthrogram where we can see a lot of contrast has been imbibed into the area of the tear on the T1 fat sat post. Uh, here with the contrast in the joint space, we can see that there's a full thickness tear with contrast going into the uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursa and a lot of fraying of the inch, which imbibe the contrast. The T2 weighted image does not show that quite as well, uh, which we can see here uh, uh, because here we still have a, we, we have a tear where you don't have a lot of distraction, so you don't have pooling of uh, fluid within the tear. These are just the torn ends and then kind of uh, uh, a very small uh, tear is going through the area of severe tendinosis here. So you can, tears can look very differently just depending upon uh, the, the type of tear that you have. I need to go through this. Okay, and then uh, again, looking at tears, looking at the different contrasts, this is T1, PD fat set, and T2. Um, again, uh, I really believe that you can see the margins of the tear. And notice that this is a complex tear. This is called the postulation that we'll talk about when I get to rotator cuff. We can see that the inferior fibers are more retracted than the superior fibers. Uh, but we can see the ends of these pretty nicely on the PD fat set, but it's uh, much better demarcated actually on the T2 uh, when we have complex tears like this. Now, quality of the tissues uh, with M MR is really the, uh, the, the only technique that we have to really look inside the tissues. Uh, and generally what we found is the histological diagnosis of tendinosis, and there have been studies done looking at uh, rotator, people with rotator cuff tears, uh, both uh, at cadavers uh, as well as biopsies in, in, non, not in living patients. And basically what they found is that and essentially 100% of people who have rotator cuff tears, the surrounding uh, tendon is tendinotic. And you, you don't have tears in normal tendons. 
So what's, uh, what the surgeon really would like to know is what are the quality of the tissues. And, and generally speaking, the amount of increased signal intensity on the PD fat set images correlates very well with increasing histologic changes of tendinosis. And then that also correlates with how good the tissue is at accepting uh, 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 both, it, it both how good it can heal as well as how well you can actually suture it and whether it will hold sutures. So uh, the, they really want to know a discussion of the surrounding soft tissues. And so that's why we include the fact that if we see a lot of high signal intensity within the adjacent tissues, we, we talk about uh, significant tendinosis in the surrounding uh, uh, tendon because that may mean that it may be more difficult to repair surgically if you have poor tissue to deal with. And then here's just kind of an example with the different techniques. This is an arthrogram, T1 fat set. We can see that there's this big tear. We can see that there's some fraying of the different ends of the tendon. With the PD fat set, we can see that there's a lot of increased signal intensity with the tendon. It's not black. Uh, as well as kind of a horizontal cleavage plane in it, which we can also see on the T1 with contrast. On the T2, we really don't see the tendinosis as well on the T2. So typically a tendon that's tendinotic will have bright signal on the PD fat set, but will be dark on a T2 weighted sequence. Whereas the areas of full thickness tear will be bright, uh, will be bright on both, whether it's contrast or whether it's just native fluid. So that's kind of the way we look at tendon integrity. One thing that you're all also familiar with is magic angle artifact. We always get some magic angle artifact uh, around the tendon uh, uh, here where you know, if it goes at a roughly 55 degree angle with respect to the direction of the main magnetic field, which would be right about in through here, uh, you, can, you can end up uh, prolonging the, uh, uh, the, the uh, T2 time of the tissues and get increased signal intensity on short TE images. <clears throat> uh, uh, you can see this on both, uh, basically you see this on short TE imaging. So T1 and short TE uh, PD fat set images. Uh, this goes away on longer T2 uh, uh, TE images. And that's another reason why we like to do T2s in the coronal plane and not PDs or T1 weighted images because it eliminates any potential confusion of uh, a magic angle artifact as a, a misinterpreting that as tendinosis. So that's the T2. Now, uh, okay. So here's a patient who came in for a rule out rotator cuff tear. Michael, what do you think here? Okay, so. It's an arthrogram. So on the PD fat set on the right, it looks like we have really bright signal at the footprint of the supraspinatus. On the T1 fat set, it looks like there's probably intact fibers. I don't see any. I don't see any uh, contrast in the like sub the chromium sub uh, deltoid. Okay. Um, but you'd want to look at the T2 just to confirm. So the question is that a tear high, and there's the T2. And so on the T2, you can see that there's intact. Footprint fibers. So, just yesterday they did an MR arthrogram out at Rolling Oaks, and they had every sequence was fat suppressed. So you can imagine that I was real happy with that. I actually had them bring the patient back to do the the non-fat suppressed images, and then dictated the case. And of course, it was a high-level athlete. Uh, but you have to be very careful if all your sequences are fat suppressed. Uh, this could easily be called a tear, but clearly on the T2 you can see that there's not a tear here. So this is an area which you nicely described really of tendinosis here, and uh, this really isn't fluid going through a tear in this location. This is just all tendinosis. So this is another reason why we like to do T2 non-fat suppressed images in this coronal plane, and so we, we can more accurately evaluate areas of tendinosis like this and differentiate it from full thickness tears. Good, Michael. And this patient was intact at surgery. And a number of years ago, before we changed our protocols, one of the biggest complaints that I had here among the sports medicine surgery is that we had, the, they had too high a false positive rate using only PD and T2 fat suppressed images. 
and I, I, I don't have that complaint anymore. Okay, uh, here's a, here's a, another case where we have a T1 fat suppressed with uh, Arthur Graham, a PD fat suppressed, and a T2. And this, this was a surgically confirmed partial tear of the inferior surface. And it just kind of points out that we can see contrast going into this. We really, it looks like there's really not, it's not just being imbibed by the tissue because it's really more uniform in signal intensity. On the T2 weighted image, uh, often, these areas are, are not very prominent. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and so these partial tears, uh, the T2 can be, uh, have, can lack sensitivity for looking at partial tears. And there's a whole debate that we'll talk about when we get to rotator cuffs themselves about the significance of partial tears. Uh, but just remember that the T2 technique uh, can be insensitive for looking for partial tears. Okay, Eshu, uh, what do you think of this one? So this is a 15-year-old baseball player with shoulder pain. Um, we have the proton density fat saturation image pre. There's a little bit of increased signal at the uh, distal supraspinatus there. Um, maybe there's a little bit of fluid too. Uh, looks like on the post arthrogram image, there's um, uh, looks maybe like a partial tear of the um, uh, along the articular sided surface of the Superspinatus. Right. So th this is this is before uh, contrast was put in. This is after contrast was put in. Uh, so it can delineate the surface a little bit better. Uh, in this, uh, so again, it depends upon the significance of partial tears. The partial tears typically are divided into low grade or high grade, where low grade is less than fifty percent of the thickness of the tendon, which I would say this one is and a high grade is greater than 50% of thickness. There's one paper, only one that I know of, there may be others, uh, that claim that people who are symptomatic with high grade partial tears uh, do well with uh, repair. Uh, uh, you're, you certainly wouldn't catch anybody repairing my partial tear in my shoulder. In fact, I have full thickness tears in both of my shoulders and you still won't find a surgeon repairing them. But, uh, but just be aware that uh, uh, sometimes you can see the, the details of the thickness of the tear a little bit better with the arth arthrogram. Uh, I don't think that this is significant. I don't think it's worth going through an arthrogram to get this little bit of information, but some people do. Okay, uh, let's see. Ash, you did the last one, right? Yeah. Rebecca, what do you think? So here on the T2 image, I do not see a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus, but on the post-contrast arthrographic arthrogram image, we see some increased signal along the articular surface of the supraspinatus. Looks like a high-grade articular surface tear. Oh, and there's fluid in the subdeltoid bursa. So here we can see that... Uh... There's fluid here, but notice it's a very bright fluid on the T2, whereas the contrast isn't so bright for reasons we talked about before. And then obviously this is not communicating with the joint space because we don't see contrast in it on the FATSAT T2, but we do see this partial tear of the supraspinatus insertion as well as probably a slap tear up here in the superior labrum. Okay. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, one thing to, to remember, though, if you put contrast in and you just do fat suppressed images, you really have to look carefully at the fluid sensitive images. And I've actually seen places where they do MR arthrography by putting the contrast in and doing T1 fat suppressed in three planes, and that's that's all they do. And in a situation like that, these bursal side partial tears. Uh, may not be detected at all. So again, uh, if you cut too many corners with MR, you can really de defeat your purpose. So that's a bursal side partial tear. And here's another non-communicating bursal side partial tear. But again, if you do the PD fat sat images, you're gonna you're gonna find these, even even with arthrography. 
And there's the T2 sequence also showing the bursocyte side partial tear. And there it is on the, sag on the sagittal plane. So this is, now, uh, here's a situation where it's, uh, this clearly, in this particular patient, we're not seeing contrast going into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So this is a morphology of the tear you'll see fairly frequently. We've already seen a bunch of these this year, where you can clearly see that the tear involves the bursal side, but you don't see frank separation of the joint side surface. And this is important to describe that in your report, because I've had a couple of uh, patients where these have been called tears uh, that went to surgery. The surgeon was all uh, upset and, and called me to complain about one of our radiologists because they called a tear and the tear wasn't there. Because remember, if they stick their arthroscope in the joint surface, they're, they're only going to see the surface here. They're not going to see the inside of the, of the tendon. So I think it's important to, when you describe these, these are tears. These are significant tears. Uh, they're unstable tears because we can see retraction here. But if it doesn't retract enough to tear the, the joint side surface, the surgeon may not be aware of it at arthroscopy. So you've got to make sure that they're aware that this is a bursal side tear, but it may not extend through the joint side uh, attachment of, of the tendon. And in a situation like this, uh, they may want to repair this if it's symptomatic, even though they may not be able to see it extending to the joint side. John? Arthroscopically, it's, it's hard to reach that spot if you don't have um, the shoulder abducted enough and uh, uh, you just can't put the scope into that area uh, and visualize it um, and that can be missed arthroscopically uh, whereas um, with MR you, you see it uh, with the arthroscope you don't uh, it, it's one of those things where you, you, um, it, it's not a hundred percent technique, either one. That's right. So you just need to describe that so the surgeon won't be surprised if they go in there and they, and they don't see the tear. You you you, you might uh, uh, when you see something like this where it's uh, right right there at the. Uh, uh, um, area that's difficult to see, um, a discussion um, on the phone would be a, a, a good thing to do. Good. Uh, and, to tell, and warn them that that's difficult to see. Great, thanks John. And you can see this is very at the anterior insertion. Okay, uh, and then here's just a subacromial ejection. And with that, you can see it goes into the subacromial space, and we can see the fluid here. Uh, we gently, mm -hmm. as you've already seen, commonly will get injections where a lot of the contrast go outside the joint space. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, John, you, you don't do many of these anymore uh, with uh, contrast, do you? Unfortunately, we do still a fair number of these, John, uh, because they're requested by the referring physicians. Uh, I don't think that they're indicated, but we, we get a, uh, quite a few of these every day. Uh, I'll be there. And I, I, I think that they, they, they kind of confuse the issue a little bit. Yeah. Um, they just see more pathology than, 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 than there really is. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't like in the, acuting of a, in the setting of acute trauma. Because then the extravasated contrast can just look like a hemorrhage. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, this is all extravasated contrast. I, I remember uh, the days when we, we were um, not too, too thrilled with uh, doing these uh, arthrographs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we do a lot of them. I'm still. You know, not thrilled about them, but if referring physicians ask for them, we do them. And uh, I have there are a number of surgeons that that I do work with where specifically in the setting where they're concerned about labral tears, they will uh, ask for arthrography. I wonder what kind of uh, um, 
statistics but um, they, they have pathologically um, in, in surgery versus the positive arthrogram. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. With, with and without, it'd be a nice paper to write. I'm trying to, I don't know how many, there, there have been papers that have shown uh, arthrography has one sensitivity specificity and non-arthrography has another one. Uh, and there have been some papers that have looked at both. Uh, most of those papers show that there is uh, some improvement in sensitivity with uh, with arthrography over non-arthrography, but I don't think any of them really come to statistical significance. It may be because they, they size the, the number of patients is too small. Yeah, I, that's, that's probably right. And then here's here's it's a case with arthrography. What a number of people like to do is an ABR view. Uh, this was, to my knowledge, initially described by Philip Tierman, uh, who uh, was was a fellow of mine in Santa Barbara, and then moved up to San Francisco, uh, where uh, the concept is that if you do arthrography and you do a regular MR arthrography, and then if you take the arm and put it up in the adducted, uh, externally rotated position above the head that you'll put traction on the anterior labrum and you can separate, if there's a tear there, you can separate it and see it better with contrast going into it. It's just uh, an example where we really couldn't see much of a tear uh, in the normal position, but in the Abra position, we could see the tear. Uh, uh, people also like this because it can actually put pressure on the posterior superior labrum, uh, which is a common area of pathology in overhead athletes that we'll talk a lot about in later lectures. We then did a study of 200 patients looking at with and without the ABRA view. And we actually found that we had a little bit higher sensitivity in the non-ABRA position, which surprised us. Uh, there are a few where what happens, you put them in the ABRA view, the, uh, the capsule tenses up here and actually forces the uh, ant anterior labrum back against the base here and absolutely obscured the tear. But we had others like this where we could see the tear better in the ABRA view. In general, we found that it only made a difference about 1% of the time. So we stopped doing ABRA views routinely because it takes uh, twice as long on the scanner. It's much more difficult for the patients. Many patients, even high-level athletes, can't hold the ABRA position well in the scanner. If they're really big athletes, a lot of the scanners are too small for them to be comfortable in the ABRA position. And a lot of athletes, even if you put them in the ABRA position with a lot of bulky muscles, they'll, they'll become very uncomfortable and move. But uh, uh, there's still many, many places who believe that uh, an ABRA view should be done routinely in arthrography. Initially, we compromised by saying patients 35 and under would get the ABRA view because they're the ones who really had significant instability and were athletes. Older than that, we didn't think that it uh, mattered much. But we typically don't do the ABRA view, uh, uh, but there are a few of our physicians do request it. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Michael, what do you think is going on here? Oh, okay, so that's the. Uh... I'm assuming these are T1 uh, weighted images and looks like when the joint space everything is markedly hypo intense. So assume they didn't dilute the gadolinium. Yeah, yeah, we're still seeing gadolinium. Yeah, see, uh, the bone vibed a little bit of it here and you got some contrast in the bone, uh, but uh, that's what happens if you don't dilute the contrast. So we typically like a diluted 200 to 1. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, now, another technique that was uh, popular for a while, especially in some outpatient imaging centers where they didn't have fluoro to do the uh, injections, was what's called indirect arthrography. And that's where you put an IV injection, you exercise the patient for 20 to 40 minutes, and then put them in the scanner. In that time period, you've got, uh, you get a contrast which extends, uh, in, uh, the blood goes into the synovium, uh, the contrast goes into the synovium from the blood system, and then it leaks out into the uh, the joint space, and then you get uh, enhancement in the joint space. Uh, 
Typically, what I found is that uh, this would enhance the, the tissue pretty well on the T1-weighted images. Uh, but most of these patients, if they get a significant arth indirect arthrography enhancement, will have a native joint space, uh, joint fluid, and I could see it much better on just the T2-weighted sequences, even without uh, contrast. So I, don't, I never thought it really added much. Uh, initial papers said that it was very accurate. Then a lot of papers uh, came around and, and basically said that the image quality was, uh, was significantly worse than the direct arthrography and that they didn't feel that the, the cost and added time was worth it. Uh, and I haven't seen this technique used very much in recent years. And, but this is a case of indirect arthrography. And then here you will get enhancement of some of the soft tissues, and you can get enhancement of tendinosis just because of the tendinopathy and the IV injection. And other examples of indirect arthrography. <laughs> and, and this is just a CT arthrogram. You're all probably familiar with those, but you just have to remember in the back of your mind if somebody can't have MR, a CT of the shoulder is very limited unless you're just looking for bony detail, uh, but you can do CT arthrography and C tears at CT arthrography. And here's an example of the long head of the biceps tendon uh, with CT arthrography and a tear. Now, the, the other thing, we've had one or two patients over the years who was allergic to iodinated contrast, couldn't have an MR, and we actually did a gadolinium arthrogram on CT. Here you put in full strength gadolinium and you can get some enhancement. This patient had, uh, we can see this, this prosthesis here, and uh, this is gadolinium as the enhancement agent uh, for CT. And I, why? Here they were looking for a labral tear. They couldn't have an MR scan. I think the patient also had a pacemaker, plus there was a lot of artifact, it would be a lot of artifact from, from the from the metal, and they were just wanting to see the interface with the with, with the labrum. Okay, so why don't we stop here? And.